In 2024, some 79 years after the end of World War II, several hundred people still live in that war on a daily basis. This may sound like an exceedingly strange and odd statement, and perhaps I'm referring to historic reenactors who like to dress up in World War II uniform and clothing and drive about in World War II vehicles. No, I'm not referring to them. Let me explain. When I was growing up in the 1970s and 80s, World War II was an event that had happened fairly recently. All of our grandparents had been through it in some form or other, and many parents as well. And it still heavily influenced culture, from TV shows like Dad's Army, Secret Army, and Alo Alo, the last being a particular favourite of mine, to children's comics like Commando. Yes, we kids had Star Wars, Back to the Future, The A-Team, and so on, but World War II was still a big part of the nation's culture. We still had World War II coinage and our small change. World War II air raid sirens were still operational, now re-rolled for civil defence in case of a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. And as today, the landscape was littered with pillboxes and bunkers designed to fend off a German invasion that never came, but which made excellent forts for us kids charging about the countryside playing war. And there was one other reminder of the cost of World War II. They were present in large numbers even 40 or 50 years or more after the conflict. Prefabs. My hometown still had prefabs, consisting of these strange one-story, flat-roofed, white temporary houses that seemed to have become permanent dwellings. Most of the war emergency homes have been swept away by the construction of modern housing estates, but as I was to discover pockets of prefabs still exist even in 2024, 80 years or so after they were built to ease the housing crisis caused by German bombing of Britain. One city in eastern England still has one of the largest prefab housing estates left, Ipswich in Suffolk. German bombing of Britain during the Blitz of 1940-41 to destroyed or badly damaged over a million houses and flats, with one in six Londoners rendered homeless. It was a similar position in many towns and cities the length and breadth of the UK. Further bombing campaigns and the V weapons attacks of 44-45 to ended up destroying hundreds of thousands more homes and badly damaging millions more, leading to a severe housing shortage. Prime Minister Winston Churchill aimed to address this problem with the Housing Temporary Accommodation Act 1944, designed to deliver half a million prefabricated houses, designed to last 10 to 15 years, within five years of the end of the war. The combined effects of war and a lack of building materials had a huge impact on the volume and quality of available housing stock. There was already a 200,000 shortfall in pre-war housing, compounded by the bombing, but the British rose to the challenge and devised a way to quickly remedy the housing shortage. This would be the half a million planned emergency factory-made or EFM housing, or prefabs. It has been said that the prefab housing campaign was run along military lines, and required as much planning and coordination as the invasion of Africa. Though the half a million figure was later reduced to 300,000, eventually just over 156,000 prefabs would be built, while in the period 1945-51, to 1.2 million new brick and concrete houses would be constructed, a large majority being the giant council estates we still see all over the UK. But the prefabs played an important role in helping to ease the housing shortfall immediately after the war, whilst the proper homes were being built. The idea of prefabricated housing was American in origin and was adapted by the British Ministry of Works. Each home had to have a minimum floor space of 635 square feet. They generally consisted of a living room, two bedrooms, a kitchen and a bathroom. The innovative service unit was very clever. The service unit was a back-to-back -back prefab kitchen that backed onto a bathroom, pre-built in a factory and slotted into the resulting house, itself normally built in four sections in a factory. 
The prefabs had a coal fire in the living room, but also a back boiler to create central heating and a constant supply of hot water. You have to remember that a lot of pre-war housing, particularly those of the working class, didn't have central heating, didn't even have indoor bathrooms and indoor lavatories. So the prefabs were the first time many families encountered the modern amenities and appliances that we take for granted today. The kitchen was also a leap forward, with a built-in oven, a refrigerator and a backsea water heater, all largely unknown in pre-war working class accommodation. There were, of course, several types of prefabs, but the commonest were the squat bungalow-type chalet houses. Common types were the Aero, a 675-square-foot, 10-ton, all-aluminium bungalow made in four prefabricated sections, delivered by lorry and fully furnished, including curtains. They only contained 2,000 components and by 1947 cost £1,610 each to make, plus the cost of the land and installation. In fact, most of the companies that were making prefabricated houses had formerly been making aircraft during World War II. 54,500 Aeros were built. The Archon was an asbestos-clad version of an earlier design called the Portal, and of course contained the pre-built service unit and two bedrooms. They came with most of the fixtures and fittings as part of the prefab, and the only things the occupiers needed to provide were beds, kitchen chairs, lounge seating and floor coverings. They were surrounded by chain-link fencing, had a coal shed at the back, manufactured out of reused corrugated iron from World War II Anderson air raid shelters, and large gardens big enough to grow vegetables and keep chickens in. Interestingly, many of the prefabs were constructed by groups of German or Italian prisoners of war who remained in the UK up until the late 1940s. In Ipswich, 150 prefabs were built along three streets. Inverness Road contains 78 prefabs, Humber Ducey Lane 34 and Sidegate Lane 32. They survive today. Built to last 10 to 15 years, they are still habitable over 75 years later. These prefabs are Tarrants, built by Tarran Industries of Hull. Currently, 127 of the prefabs are owned by Ipswich Council, which maintains the properties to a very high standard. They are very popular with older residents, who like the bungalow layout without stairs to climb and the generous gardens. There has been consistent opposition in Ipswich to their demolition and replacement by more modern houses. The Tarran bungalows have a wooden frame, overclad with precast concrete panels, some 19,000 of these prefabs being built in total. It is noticeable when you visit these streets that the houses are kept neat and tidy, and evidently are well looked after by residents. They have been progressively upgraded since the war, renovated inside with more modern amenities and appliances, and with drives for cars. But the basic compact design remains today. The houses have space around them, and big gardens, compared with the cramped modern housing estates, and make for a low-density population. Since World War II ended, most of the 156,000 prefabs across the UK have been demolished to make way for more solid structures. One of the largest surviving single estates is the Excalibur Estate in Catford in the London borough of Lewisham, with 187 prefabs. Controversially, however, this has been set for demolition in the mid-2020s. The local council plans to replace the 187 prefabs on the site with 371 new houses, demonstrating how spacious the prefabs are in comparison with modern housing, particularly gardens. It looks like the 150 prefabs of Ipswich are safe for now, and they remain an enduring reminder of both the damage inflicted on the UK by German bombing, but also of the ingenuity of the wartime authorities in trying to sort the problem out quickly, and of the extreme durability of such temporary housing, and how they have gone from derided emergency accommodation to much-loved historical survivors. Many thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.